Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman. You're listening to No Filter. And I spend a lot of time thinking about, worrying about, celebrating women. And so does my guest today, Catelyn Moran, who is one of the world's most famous and funniest feminists. What you're about to hear, though, are two feminists worrying about men and boys. We are talking about the biggest mental, physical and emotional challenges that they're facing right now. And we're surfacing some of Catelyn's ideas for what we can do to help them and what they can do to help themselves. Because Catelyn has written a new book. It's certainly a plot twist because after writing seven books, all about girls and all about women, including the iconic How to Be a Woman, Catelyn has written a book called What About Men? Yes, seriously, genuinely, and even heartbreakingly, that's what this conversation is going to be. And yeah, I know that this is not probably what you were expecting in a conversation between two women, but hear me out. Thanks to feminists like Catelyn and those that came before her, like Jermaine Greer, there's a better understanding than there ever has been that women and girls are wildly disadvantaged in the world for all the reasons you know. There's the pay gap, domestic violence, body image, sexual assault, and in some countries, including America, women do not even have legal rights over their own bodies. In some countries, women can't drive or go to school. Feminism has made the world a lot better for women, it's true, even though there is still a long way to go. But what about the men? What about the boys? How are they doing? Not so well, as it turns out. Boys underachieve at school compared to girls. Boys are more likely to be excluded from school. Boys are less likely to go into further education and more likely to be prescribed prescription medication for ADHD or disruptive behaviour. Men, especially straight white men, are assumed to be suspicious, useless, simple, arrogant, cavemen or toxic narcissists. They're also the most likely to die by suicide, be victims of violence, suffer loneliness, experience homelessness or be imprisoned, die at work or in wars and lose custody of their children. There's also the devastating effect of porn on men. So is it that surprising that into this void leaps the terrifying influence of Andrew Tate and the problematic messaging of Jordan Peterson? And then how can you complain about anything when you're a straight white man? Oh, poor men. He's the world's tiniest violin. Except you know who's also a straight white man? The 13-year-old boy sitting alone in his bedroom, wondering if there's any point to him being here, who keeps hearing about how men are toxic and privileged and rapey. As an author, screenwriter and columnist, Catelyn has shocked everyone, including herself, by writing this book called What About Men? And today you're going to hear why she decided to do that and how she thinks we can help men as their partners, their mothers, their daughters and their friends. If you're not familiar with Catelyn's work, you are in for a treat. She grew up as the eldest of eight kids in a three-bedroom council house with no money. She left school at age 11 to pretty much homeschool herself because her mum was so busy with babies. She decided at age 13 to become a writer and she sat down and wrote a novel, which was published when she was 15. And a year later, she had a national newspaper column. And today, she's one of the most acclaimed and successful journalists and writers in the UK and the world. In everything she does, Catelyn is laugh out loud funny and this new book is a must read for every woman who has a man or boy in her life that she loves. Because as Catelyn points out, unless you live on a ladies only commune, the lives of men and women will always be intertwined. If they do better, so will we. Fasten your seatbelts and pop your preconceptions in a drawer. Is it harder to be a man than a woman these days? Catelyn's surprising answer is, in many ways, yes. Was it today that Jordan Peterson shared your excerpt from GQ? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. He's supposed to be like the most intelligent man in the world or one of them, like the most important public intellectual of our time. Mm -hmm. But he shared a piece to his 10 million followers in which 
I think I'd do a pretty good demolishment job of his entire career and oeuvre. And he's done me a massive favour. Like GQ are absolutely thrilled. <laughs> and yeah. Everybody's reading where I explain why I just don't think he's a good role model for boys or men. The advice that he gives is either the kind of stuff your mum would say for free, like make your bed, pet a cat in the street, or mad stuff about lobsters. Like this whole thing that like <laughs> yeah. kind of men are like lobsters. So if a male lobster loses in a fight, a chemical reaction happens in its brain where its brain liquefies and it becomes brain damaged and it's always a submissive lobster ever after. And from this one animal in a world where we have like over 3 billion species, Jordan Peter has extrapolated that this would happen to humans too. And that if men ever lose in a fight, if they ever stop being aggressive, they too would become brain damaged. So if this were true, the Olympics would be a bloodbath and even every Christmas game of Scrabble with the family around the table would be a human rights issue. Very palpably, human beings aren't lobsters. We don't have gigantic, delicious hands. We don't <laughs> urinate out of our eyes. There are so many ways in which we're not lobsters. And I can't believe that people are, I didn't even go to school at an university and I was halfway through his book going, I'm fairly sure I can demolish a great deal of the logic in this book. This guy is not the smartest guy in the world. He's just a man in a waistcoat who sounds, to be honest, a bit like Kermit from The Muppet Show. <laughs> Look, you writing a book about men was a plot twist I didn't see coming. Right. It really was. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since, because I know that for a lot of women, myself included, having sons is when you start, as a feminist, start thinking about things a little bit differently. That wasn't the case for you, what sparked the interest? Well, I have girls, right? So I think most feminists have this, like kind of you spend all your time talking about the women and the girls. At some point, usually three questions in, someone's going to go, okay, girls are women, I get it. But what about men? Mm. And for the first five or six years, I was incredibly peevish. I was like, I don't care. They're fine. Like, kind of like I just I'm team tits. And it would be the ultimate irony of feminism if women had to solve all the problems of women and then we had to solve the problems of men. So I'm off the case. They'll have to sort it out themselves. And then I was doing an event on International Women's Day two years ago in a college, half boys, half girls, 15, 16, and thought we'd be talking about the problems of women and girls. And the boys weren't having any of it. They hijacked the whole thing and they were like, we're not going to talk about women and girls anymore. We need to talk about men. Men are losing and women are winning. It is harder to be a man now than it is to be a woman. Feminism has gone too far. And they were angry. And when you meet a cohort of people who are angry, that always intrigues me because angry people are actually scared people. So it's like, how can you be scared of girls and the progress they've made? Like, palpably, women aren't winning. Like, you know, we know all the stats. We're still underrepresented in business, in politics, in sport. The pay gap still exists. One in four of us will be sexually assaulted or raped. So in the material world, women aren't winning. So what is it the women have got that's making you scared and angry? And the only thing we have is feminism. Like, we have made being a woman look brilliant in the last 15 years. There's this upswell about being a woman. We keep saying the future is female. We're full of these amazing feminist heroes. We can talk and activate and march. And like, there's just a fever and a heat and a brilliance and a shamelessness, a brilliant guilt-free air about being a girl and a woman now that I certainly didn't have in my day. And I think the boys are envious of that. I think they envy the fact that we can talk about our problems. And so I was like, okay, this is a problem. This generation of boys are getting angry and it's because basically they're scared and jealous of women. I need to clear all my projects and write this book about boys because as a feminist, we know that half of all girls and women's problems are men. Scared men, angry men, abusive men, misogynist men. And we can't fix the girls unless we fix the boys. And this generation are going wrong. So I was like, I need to write a book and try and tackle this. You say that straight white men are not encouraged to celebrate what they are. There are no big events on International Men's Day. This is all the problem of straight white men has become a default statement on social media applied to absolutely everything, despite the fact that straight white men also includes utterly powerless, depressed 13-year-old boys sitting in their beds starting to wonder if there's any point in getting up in the morning. That hit me like a gut punch as the mother of a 25-year-old son but also a 14-year-old son because I'd never thought about it like that. When did being a straight white man become an insult and what effect do you think that that's had on a new generation? I'm both pleased and sad that it hit you like a gut punch because I'm oh. in the middle of a tour at the moment and every night when I'm talking about this, because it's still mainly women, ironically, that are turning up to my gigs, it looks like it will be the women that will fix the men. They're the ones that have turned out to read this book and they gasp when we start talking about this. Just yeah. I've done it. Like, you know, it's a default to me as a feminist to just be like, oh, typical men typical straight white men, there's the patriarchy, toxic masculinity. 
for people of our generation, when we're saying this, it's in the knowledge of some perspective. We know what the last 10,000 years of patriarchy have been, how very recent women being able to vote or having any kind of power has been, and how recently Benny Hill was chasing sexy schoolgirls around a tree. If you're a 15-year-old boy, you have none of that perspective. All you know is that particularly straight white men are the one group that you're allowed to make jokes about. They're the one group you're allowed to eye roll about. All these other groups, people of color, the LGBT community, the feminist community, we have organized and we have campaigns and we've talked about ourselves. But even saying the phrase straight white man still makes me feel a bit uncomfortable because usually when people are saying straight white men, we're about to have a very problematic conversation. Yeah. You know, someone's about to be racist, someone's about to be sexist, someone's about to be homophobic. But those boys know that. They know that simply by describing themselves as straight white men, they sound like a problem. There's a certain amount of shame in just literally describing the category that you're in. And if you shame, as women know, if you shame the community, you know, we were brought up in shame, it boils at your soul. And, you know, for boys to not even be able to say what they are and for them to always be the butt of a joke and for there to be no organisation around talking about their problems, you know, all the mums in the audience are going, oh, gosh, yeah, 15 years has passed, 20 years has passed, and we have just been talking about boys in the way that I remember us talking about women 20 years ago. We shame them, we belittle them. And it's particularly bad, speaking personally, if you've got a daughter Mm -hmm. as well, because we're trying so hard, as I do, to boost my daughter. My daughter's 17. And a year or two ago, I was in the car with my son and we were listening to some music or something, and he just said in an offhand way, oh, I know you and Coco hate men. And I was like, what? And I was like, oh, shit. And then we're like, we don't hate men. And he said, you always talk about probably straight white men or something. And it's like, oh, we've worked so hard even in our homes but in society to build up our girls that our boys have been listening. And this is the eternal shit of being a parent, right? <sighs> you think you're doing one right thing and it's equal and opposite reactions. And, like, it was the same. It's having that lens and suddenly going, oh, in the same way that I realised with my daughter when she was very depressed and sort of going through an eating disorder that I'd spent years saying to her, you know, but don't worry about exams and your life and stuff. Me and dad just want you to be happy. That's the most important thing. And I thought that was a great thing to say. But, of course, she was hearing, be happy. Like, if you are unhappy, don't let mum and dad know because that's yeah. the most important thing and this is the eternal thing about being a parent like you think you're doing the right thing and then suddenly you just have a focus shift and go oh god actually that was screwing them up and it's the same with our boys I've I've done exactly the same as you you think all your stride of feminism is to build up the girls and you suddenly forget the boys have been listening and they are scared and upset you talk about fear in the book and also in Australia and I think in the UK as well we've had a lot of conversations around consent and schoolgirls and young women and There's been great conversations and huge progress with young girls coming out and saying, this happened to me. Now, boys have also been listening to this conversation and have they been internalising this message that I'm probably a potential rapist or my friends are potentially rapists? And there is so much fear as well. So one of the chapters in the book is talking about how boys were very resistant to hearing girls talking about their fear of rape and sexual assault because boys are so scared of being falsely accused of rape and sexual assault. And this is one of those things, again, where you realise, ah, we need some grown-ups in this conversation because in schools, these Chinese whispers, these kind of like sort of panics and fears that go through boys, like it might happen to me. Like if I even talk to a girl, I might be accused of something and they see that as an equal fear to women's actual statistically provable fear of being sexually assaulted or raped. One in four of us will be. And I just wanted to bring some clarity to that and just tell them a couple of facts, like only 2% of false rape accusations are proven to be false rape accusations. The rest are rape. So you are more likely as a boy to be raped than to be falsely accused of rape. And then I just wanted to give them some practical advice as well, because I think the older women have been very good over the last couple of years at telling younger women, don't fancy bad boys. Don't fancy a boy in leather trousers who's going to treat you badly. I think we've done really well at telling our girls, that's not a good boyfriend for you. You Essentially, you want to grow up and marry a man who looks a bit like a womble and wears a cardigan and is into <laughs> carbohydrates and oral sex. Like, don't go with the rock star. It's going to be bad for you. But the older men are not telling the boys that there is an old saying that does not work for them. Are the amount of men that I know who go, crazy girls are the best in bed. That's who you want to be having sex with. The wow. crazy girls, the freaks in the bed. You want to be shagging the crazy girls. Don't shag a crazy girl. Like, what does a crazy girl mean? That's someone who's suffering with mental issues. That's someone who's out of control. That's someone who's very unhappy. If you are worried about false rape allegations, the worst thing you can do is go and have sex with someone who's going through a terrible time mentally. Let her have some therapy. 
the last thing she needs is your penis. I do see myself as the kind of dirty auntie who sits in the shed at the bottom of the garden on Christmas Day, smoking a cigarette and calling the teenagers over and going, your mum and dad probably aren't talking to you about this, but I'm going to tell you this stuff. I'm going to give you the real talk. So the idea of the book is that half the chapters are chapters that wives will read and show to their husbands and go, yes. Catelyn says this, do you agree? And the other half of chapters that they'll give to their teenage boys and go, Catelyn says this, what do you think? And you can blame it all on me. I actually was taking photos and texting them to my husband saying, oh. you need to have this conversation with yeah. him. And then you'll be delighted to hear that my 14-year-old son quoted you back to me couple of days ago, totally unprompted, and I didn't even realise it was you until I was got to that part in your book. He said to me exactly what you wrote in the book about if a woman tweets, I'm proud to be a woman, can you just talk about that with the difference between a woman and a man saying that? I mean, part of the problem is women have just been absolutely excellent over the last 20 years. So we've been so good at celebrating ourselves. So for instance, the body positivity movement. If you are a fat girl, when I grew up, that was basically the end of your life and you just had to pretend you don't exist. Now there's all these girls on Instagram who are sitting there in bikinis with their rolls out and their stretch marks, taking pictures and smiling. And all their friends will be posting, you go queen. Yes, fire emoji, dancing girl emoji. We're so good at celebrating each other as soon as we make a bold move. If a fat teenage boy put on his swimming trunks and took a picture of himself and posted it on social media, there would either be tumbleweed, no one would say anything. Unfortunately, there'd be a couple of people going, well, that's a bit gay. Or people would go, well, that's a bit creepy. Why are you posting a picture of yourself in your pants? We don't have a culture of boys celebrating each other and supporting each other in the way that I think as women we take for granted. And the main thing that I'm trying to do in this book is just point out the difference, which I think could change very easily in male and female communication. And it comes down to the men's and the women's toilets. So if you're a woman and you have a problem and you go into the ladies' toilets, whatever your problem is, a bunch of bitches you've never met before will sort your shit out for <laughs> they you. They will. They will give you a tampon. They will give you a safety pin. They'll be adjusting your eyeliner, which you've cried off. They'll be telling you, he's a bastard, fucking dump him. Yes. They'll put their arms around you, take you on the dance floor, and you'll be like, I made some new friends in the ladies. Yay! My understanding is that men aren't making friends in the men's toilets. Like, men are not going into the men's toilets with their problems and coming out and going, a bunch of strange guys just helped me out, and now I've made some friends. Yeah. And I don't think there's any reason why boys shouldn't have that. Although the internet is very torn on this. Usually when I release a book, everyone's like, yay, Catelyn, hooray. That's very much not happened with this book. I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, right? I've had to turn my social media off because before this book came out, so no one had read it, there were so many angry men who presumed they knew what this book was and were furious. What did they think it was about and what's their point? Well, their biggest argument seemed to be, and they split into two camps, which in itself was fascinating. One half were going, how patronizing of you to generalize and say that men find it difficult to talk about their emotions and support each other. Like, you know, that's such a reductive old fashioned thing. Men are not like that. That's so patronizing. Like, screw you. This is appalling. And then the other half, equally vocal, were, how dare you tell men that they need to be more emotional and kind of like talk God. about their problems and support each other. Men are not biologically wired to do that. You're trying to turn men into women. At which point I was like, you two need to talk to each other. Wow. Like, can you agree on a form of abuse and come back to me as in a group? But that's the problem in a nutshell, right? Like yeah. there just isn't a conversation between men about what men is and the way that yeah. there is with women. So it's like, it's down to you guys to work this out. But the fact that you've got two opposing views and you don't even know you disagree with each other, proves to me there isn't a conversation happening about men. So ipso facto, I wrote this book and please stop hating me on the internet. That brings me to your first rule, which is 50% of young men's problems occur to because of a fear of being called girly, soft, or primarily gay. Yeah. Can you talk about that? So it's really interesting. I looked to see if there had been like a men's movement because essentially what I'm doing in this book is going, we need to have a male equivalent of feminism. I think that's what boys are ultimately envious of. I think that's why they're angry. That's what they want. And I was researching if anyone had tried to do this before. And there were many attempts to have something like a feminist movement for men, but it would always break up usually because of homophobia. Like when men started trying to be more tender, reach out to each other, hug each other, have some sense of community, there'd always be a couple of people just going, ah, you bender, and the whole thing would fail. And what I find very interesting that even though this new generation now do have their problems, they live in a world of Andrew Tate, they are notably demonstrably more physically 
comfortable with each other. I see teenage boys hugging each other when their parents are going through divorces going, oh, mate, that must be tough for you. And that's happened at the same time that we've seen the biggest ever decline in homophobia. So we've always talked about the sort of the kinship between straight women and gay men. But really weirdly, the fates of straight men and gay men are very much intertwined because if straight men are scared of being accused of gay because gay men are seen as being lesser, it necessarily sort of limits what they can do. Whereas in a new generation where for so many young people, the idea of being homophobic is just crazy they just the progress has been incredible they don't have that fear and so that's a really good and important piece of progress but yeah it's definitely for older men to be female to be gay is a terrifying thing to be accused of and that limits them you talk about even the difference with body positivity gay men are very appreciative of each other's bodies and there's a lot more like on social media you can be a hairy bear you can be A scrawny guy, you can be buff and you will get a lot of positive affirmation, whereas women are forever telling each other, you look so hot, your tits look great in that bra, your ass looks great in those jeans. We're forever boosting each other up, whereas men don't do that. No. And also at the same time, kind of like it's the body image for men has changed so radically in my lifetime. So when I was growing up, like the big action heroes were Indiana Jones and Han Solo. So Indiana Jones is fit for an archaeologist. Yeah. And Han Solo frequently looks like he's about to lean on the wall of the Millennium Falcon with a fag and go, I am knackered. Luke Skywalker looks like a callow youth who writes poetry. And in the figurines that I played with when I was a kid, he's just this skinny, scrawny blonde boy. They brought out the new reboots of the Star Wars figurines recently. And suddenly Luke Skywalker has got pecs and biceps and he's wearing Mm. a robe slashed to the waist. Like Chris Hemsworth. Yep. And similarly, in the superhero films now, I went for a long drunken lunch with the director of a massive superhero franchise. And he was saying, I've worked with women and men. It's been brutal for women in Hollywood because basically they can't eat. But it's far harder for men now because they have to become so muscular to play these superhero roles that they basically have the training regimes of Olympic athletes. They have to dehydrate, not drink all day so that their veins and their muscles show up. And then they're eating so much protein, they're constipated. A lot of them are taking steroids. And then they have to sit in an ice bath afterwards because they are in so much physical pain. And the difference is that even though we still know there are unrealistic beauty standards in Hollywood, women talk about it now. You get female stars taking off their high heels and throwing them down the red carpet going, they're really uncomfortable. You get Tina Fey and Amy Poehler making jokes about the fact that women don't eat. We make jokes about this. Mm. Social media is full of it. No man has ever said these are ridiculous, unrealistic body images for men. And we see in young boys, like kind of this rise of the awfully named bigorexia, Mm. which I thought was people wanting to be Tom Hanks in the film Big, but (laughs) is unfortunately boys who feel they're not muscular enough. But one in 10 gym going boys have said that they have felt suicidal about their bodies because they're not muscular enough. But there's still not a conversation about that. It's just like, oh, going to the gym is good, right? Well, not if it goes too far, not if you never feel satisfied with who you are and not if there's no conversation about it. When we're talking about whose fault things are, because it's nice to apportion blame, and for women often the answer is the patriarchy. For those who don't understand what the patriarchy is, and a lot of men don't, and I find that I have these arguments with my husband when I'll be talking about the pressure I feel to get Botox and about the patriarchy, and he's like, but I don't want you to get Botox. I don't know any man who – and I'm like, the patriarchy isn't you. Can you help me explain what the patriarchy is? So I've had these arguments too where men are kind of going like, you know, sort of like, well, you know, am I the patriarchy? It's like, no, 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 you're just a man called Patrick. Like, kind yes. of like you're not part of the patriarchy. So Moran's rule number two is the patriarchy is screwing over men as hard as it's screwing over women. And the patriarchy is just those outdated notions of what gender is. So if you as a man feel that you need to be the main breadwinner, if you feel that you need to be muscular, if you feel that you need to protect people and be the leader of your family, or you are worried about being emotionally open or being accused of being gay or female in anything that you do, then that's the patriarchal ideas of what a man should be. In the same way, mm. the patriarchal ideas of what a woman should be is that we're always emotional and open and tender and we mother until it kills ourselves and we must be sexy and beautiful and we should not age past the age of 30. So these are all the ideas that we have. And the counter arguments, the weapon, the main weapon against patriarchy has been feminism. Feminism is the only thing we've ever invented that looks at gender roles. And women have been really good at the last 150 years at going, this stuff that men have got, like being able to earn money and being able to be sexually free and being able to vote and being able to go into politics and being able to own their own property and run businesses and stuff. We want that. We don't see why that should be a male thing. And we have taken that. Mm. Like, you know, we're in space. We rule countries. Like, we've still got a long way to go. We have options. Yeah. 
But these things that only men could do 150 years ago, now women, you know, increasingly enjoy. Whereas the things that women do, men have not come and taken from those. And when I look through a list of the problems of men and boys, a lot of them are that they need to come and take things from the female world now. There are things that are gendered as female that they need to take. So there's a whole bunch of statistics I go through at the beginning of the book. Boys are more likely to be medicated at school for disruptive behaviour. They're more likely to be excluded, less likely to go on to further education, more likely to be addicted to drugs, alcohol or pornography, to join a gang. They make up the majority of the homeless population, the prison population, and the leading cause of death for men under the age of 50 in this country is suicide. So if women are winning at academia, if they're feeling they don't need to be part of a gang and a structure, if they are not committing suicide because they can seek help and talk about their emotions then clearly these are things that men need to be able to do and these Mm. would solve a lot of these structural problems but for whatever reason men feel they can't do that because it's female i guess so this is the argument of the book it's going look what feminism has done for women we took a bunch of your male stuff and it's definitely improved our lives why don't you come and take a bunch of this female stuff and let's just abolish these gender roles fuck the patriarchy, let's just have Mm. whatever we need as human beings because we're here for such a short amount of time Mm. in our lives. And I just, I'm the eldest of eight kids and half are boys and half girls. And essentially, you know, we're brothers and sisters on this earth and we're all in a car and all the boys and girls are sitting on the back seat and we're all just driving to our final destination, which is the grave. And if we spend that entire journey with the men and the women arguing on the back seat, we've Mm. completely wasted our lives. We're in this together. Up next, the terrifying impact of Andrew Tate on a generation of young men and boys. Gloria Steinem says that gender roles are prisons and for men there's wall-to-wall carpet and someone brings you coffee, but they're still prisons. But you ask in the book, how can men blame the patriarchy when, as a straight white man, you look like the patriarchy? Exactly. And it's having that lens where you just suddenly, there's a friend of mine, he talks about putting your feminist glasses on. The first time you start looking at things through a feminist lens and you can only put them on for one minute at the beginning because you're like, ah, my eyes burn. (laughs) (laughs) I see too much truth and clarity now. And it takes a while to get your eye in, I think, for boys to realize the prison they're in. And one of the key things for that is the misunderstanding of power and its usefulness. We live in a world now where because we were so concentrating on the feminism, the men of my age, they were very much, let the ladies take a a role now. Like men won't talk about their problems, kind of let the ladies have a go. They have perspective on 10,000 years of patriarchy and Benny Hill chasing sexy school girls around a tree. But our kids, our 15 year old kids, they don't have, the boys don't have that perspective. So to them, they've only grown up in an era where we're saying the future is female, Mm. typical men, typical straight white. So they don't have that perspective. So they just feel you know, even saying the phrase straight white boy, like kind of like all these things, they don't realize that it's a recent corrective. They just think it's really unfair. And the key thing is because into the void where liberal men weren't talking about boys, people like Andrew Tate have stepped. And the main problem with Andrew Tate, who's an absolute representation of the patriarchy, is his offer is every problem that you have as a boy is that you need power. You need physical power. You need to be very ripped. You need to have financial power. Here are my business deals, which you will pay me for my advice. It's basically a Ponzi scheme that he runs. And you need power over women. That's what's going to make you feel better. And the solution to feeling like a depressed, anxious teenage boy who doesn't know his place in the world isn't power or power over women. What they need is what women have had, which is empowerment. They need to learn to self-soothe. They need to learn to make their lives beautiful. They need to learn to communicate. They need to confess their tenderness and weakness and vulnerability and feel safe in that. And that's why I wrote the book, really, to just go, power will not solve your problems. What you need is empowerment. And the great thing about empowerment is it means that you don't have to sex traffic a load of women to a bunker in Romania and then be questioned repeatedly by the police, as Andrew Tate has. You can just empower yourself starting now in your own room. What would make you happy? You can do it yourself. You don't need to involve anyone else. I'm so glad you wrote about him in the book and that we're talking about him. I remember the first time I interviewed you many years ago, I was working from home at the time and I remember being so excited. My mum and my daughter came in and I ushered them over to meet you on Zoom because it was so exciting. And I took a photo of you with them and And it's like these three generations of women who were looking to you as a feminist role model. Oh. I can't think of anyone that I'd pull my sons over to meet. You know what I mean? So into the void has stepped Jordan Peterson, who we've talked about, and Andrew Tate. And there are a lot of women, a lot of mothers, 
who were freaked out. I mean, you talked about the premise of Andrew Tate and what it's based on, but you know, for those who aren't familiar with his teachings, you've written here that he's the king of toxic masculinity. He said that women shouldn't be allowed to drive, should bear responsibility for being raped, that women are at their peak between 18 and 25 because they haven't had too much dick. And then he says if their partners accuse them of cheating, bang out the machete, boom in her face and grip her by the neck and say, shut up, bitch. You also say, simply screaming, you're a fan of a criminal to your son who talks about Andrew Tate will ultimately get us nowhere. What will get us somewhere? Well, I'm in the middle of a tour at the moment and, like, when I talk about Andrew Tate, the room goes pin drop quiet and I'm doing two to three hour signings and it's either mothers who are worried about Andrew Tate or people who work in schools or support services are worried about him. So every school in the UK has had to have a staff meeting to deal with the disruption that he causes in classes. They are shouting out his catchphrases. Female teachers are getting homework handed back to them by boys that have make me a sandwich written on the bottom because they don't believe women should teach them. Male teachers are being asked, sir, do you let your wife go out on her own? So I know this is a problem and people are so worried about this. They're like, how could we good liberal people have made a son like this? And a lot of it's teenage rebellion. Like if Mm. you've been going on about feminism and the women, the boys are going to go, oh, our boy is bad boys. But I found, I searched and searched and searched and I found an amazing guy. He's called Josh Spears. He works in schools and his technique is to go, yeah, you can't confront a boy and go, you made a mistake. You've got the wrong hero. Mm. So he opens up a conversation and he goes, I used to have a hero when I was your age. I had someone I greatly admired, whose work I loved, and he was like a massive hero to me. And his name was Kevin Spacey. And he was later accused of terrible sexual crimes. And I was faced with a choice at that moment. Would I not believe all the people who'd accused him of this? Would I double down on my fandom and go, no, I basically believe this is a conspiracy. This is my guy. I'm with him, ride or die. Or do I do what you have to do as you become an adult and you will have to do over and over again and go, oh, a hero has let me down and sit in that upset and heartbreak for a minute and go, yeah, a hero has let me down. This is the first time it's happened. It will happen again. And he was saying when he talks to boys about this, this is where they go quiet and they're like, oh, because it just hasn't occurred to them that a hero could let you down, that maybe this is what might happen with Tate. Mm. And then he goes, so then but I've got the boys engaged now. And he was like, the whole thing is you need to give people off ramps into conversations. You need to give them spaces to change their minds. So then he starts talking about, you know, who are good heroes, like particularly young people like a choice. We love a catalogue. You know, you want to look through. I can remember getting like the Argos catalogue, which is the mail order company over here and going, when I grow up, I'm going to get that kettle and that bath mat and we're the same with our heroes and girls are really good at collecting female heroes every teenage girl's wall is covered with a panoply of incredible heroes mine still is now and i'm 51 right but we haven't quite got that lexicon for the boys so it was really interesting when i started to research good role models for boys i googled most loved men in the world i was like that's a good place to start most loved women in the world endless lists it took me 10 google results pages to get to the first list of the most loved men in the world because what google kept giving me was the most powerful men in the world and that in itself is part again we keep coming back to power rather than any other skill empowerment But when you do look at the heroes that are out there, there are amazing role models. People like David Attenborough, Keanu Reeves, like the footballer Marcus Rashford over here is a working class boy. He does amazing work for hungry kids. So they are out there, but we haven't yet joined the dots and sort of made them part of a movement in the way that we have mm. with all our female heroes. All our female heroes are part of feminism. So there's a united mm. movement that sort of coalesces and you sort of yeah. half the rearing that has happened of my teenage daughters was not done by me it was done by their feminist heroes in the feminist movement they're part of something there isn't that constellation of heroes with a kind of joined up agenda for boys at the moment but then that should be relatively easy to do we don't need politics to be involved in that it's not even an economical thing it's a cultural thing we just need to start conversations about who are great heroes and start joining the dots and putting them together in what would start to when you look at all of them together start to look like a movement for boys and men. Another thing that is so outside our realm of experience for most women is discovering that their young son is watching porn and not knowing how to talk to him about it. You had a conversation, again, you don't have a son, but you wrote in an earlier book about your fears of this son of a friend called Sam who was 10 at the time. By the time you wrote this book, Sam was 21 and you actually went back to Sam and said, hey, will you have a conversation with me about porn and your experience of it? And he told you that he was two years clean from porn. What did you learn in that weird conversation in your backyard with Sam? 
Well, that was a weird piece of synchronicity. So in How to Be a Woman that came out in 2010, I was talking about porn from the female perspective and going, you know, this stuff is horrible for girls, basically. And I hope by the time my girls are looking for porn on the internet, they'll find things that's far more tender and creative and beautiful and realistic. Oh, yes, that's what's happened. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I weep for my former innocent self. And I was going, I wish this not just for my girls, but for the boys I know, for instance, yeah. Sam, you know, I think would be terrified to see violent online pornography. It, mm. Boys are just as scared as the girls. And Sam is now 22. We went on holiday a couple of years ago and he went, yeah, it's really funny because when you published that book and you said, I hope by the time Sam starts watching porn, there's some nice stuff out there. I was already watching porn. Mm. I'd been watching it since the age of eight. Mm -hmm. That's the average age. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think as parents, until we really engage in this, we think, well, we definitely need to have talked to them about porn by the time they're 13, but let's be on the front foot and do it at 11. Mm. No, it's seven, eight, nine, because yeah. Your child's entry into the world of watching pornography is absolutely predicated on usually the most troubled kid in your class going, look at this, and showing you a mobile phone that has something disgusting or funny or horny, and then that's it. And the problem is because we don't know. We have no idea they're watching it at this age. There's no one there to tell them the really important thing about porn, which is you're not just watching porn and laughing at it or being horrified or being aroused. It's a two-way street. The porn looks into you. Because you are absolutely malleable, wet clay at that age. And whatever you see sexually at that age becomes your sexual imagination. Those become your sexual preferences. What you're oh, watching God. will stay with you forever. You're going to have these chemical reactions. The first time you get aroused seeing something in porn, whatever it is, that's going to keep arousing you for the rest of your life. And when you look at the stuff that is online, like, for instance, the prevalence of sexual strangulation in pornography, this has come out of nowhere in this generation. I've got friends of my age who are divorced and going out on the dating scene for the first time in 20 years who are going, where did this come from? Yeah. Like literally one in three sexual encounters they're having without any mm -hmm. discussion. Suddenly the strangulation, which is terrifying. Women are so much smaller than men. And if the, your method of communication is closed off because someone's hand is on your throat, there's already been 60 deaths in this country, women who've been killed through sexual discrimination gone wrong. So the idea that teenagers may be a bit drunk and horny are trying this, it's not a good sexual hobby for young people. I make the plea in the book that we just, if you want to be dizzy, which is what strangulation essentially makes happen, just go back to our old traditional methods of either holding your breath or using poppers. Like oh, this is this poppers. is what your forefathers did. Yeah, bit of amyl nitrate. Bit of good old fashioned poppers. Right, that's the smell of fun. Like kind of if you want to be yeah. dizzy, don't do anything that could lead to a death. And you know, I'm not here to kink shame. Go with God if you've talked about it and you both want it. Yeah. But what I'm hearing is that no one is talking about this. It's that issue of consent. It's too embarrassing to have a conversation about what you're going to do. It's more embarrassing if someone dies or you're calling nine nine nine. Anal sex is the same, which you talk about. There used to be things that were seen as it's kind of like if there's a menu on MasterChef, some people really like eating brains, but not everyone. And imagine if on MasterChef every meal that they cooked was brains. It's been presented as this kind of as standard as the missionary position. Yeah, it's like the potatoes of sex yeah. now. And again, you know, go with God. If that's what you yeah. like – Absolutely fantastic. I like to be very realistic about things. It's like you need to make an informed choice about this. Mm. And I think because, again, you see anal sex in pornography and it's so common. It's like, come on, the dirty auntie is going to give you the proper talk about this. The women who are in porn films have prepared for anal sex scenes. They have not eaten all day and they have hosed out their bum holes. You are probably not going to have someone who is a professional porn actress who has prepared their bum hole for sex. So if you really crave anal sex, you need to know that that is probably going to be some poo sex as well. That's the poo area. This may happen to you. So how much do you really want to have anal sex? Like kind of just be prepared for it. If you're into poo as well, then hurrah, absolutely make your informed choice. But, but that also explains why women are often reluctant. Like you did such a good job of explaining what the reluctance is from women. Like it's a poo hole and not every woman wants that in there. Or if you do want it, give me 24 hours notice yeah. and, that, and I'll get my mom home. And out. I won't like, eat any corn. Yeah, but the amount of women I know who, oh, yeah, that corn bit, yeah. <laughs> I describe a sexual encounter with a friend of mine that ended up with a piece of sweet corn ending up on the end of a man's penis and really the evening ending quite badly at that point. But that's the anal sex breaks, man. Yeah. You know, if you are fearful of finding a piece of sweet corn on the end of your dick, then, you know, maybe give me 24 hours warning before we have anal sex. It didn't happen to me, by the way. It was a friend. You talk about the difference between sexual fantasies and sexual beliefs for men and women. And I thought that was really, really interesting. What is the difference? 
So I was really interested to see why in many studies, women do talk about rape fantasies, where it's like, I am safe, it's with someone I know, but the play is that it's rape or I'm being overwhelmed and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, where does that come from? That's interesting. Why? Like, if we lived in a world where, I don't know, it was only women and like, kind of like, would we invent rape fantasies from scratch? And that's where I went, oh, maybe these aren't fantasies, maybe they're beliefs. You know, maybe we believe that there's a chance that one in four of us will be sexually assaulted or raped. So there's a blurring. I just like looking at the definitions of this and going, well, why is this in our minds? And often sexual fantasies are a way of dealing with trauma. So for instance, it was very prevalent for men in the generation before me. Their big fantasy was like a woman in stockings and suspenders and high heels, spanking them or whipping them. And that was at a time when there was more corporal punishment and you'd be more likely to be beaten by a woman in your life, whether it be a teacher or a mother. And so the childhood trauma of being beaten by a woman who in those days would have been wearing stockings and high heels and stuff spanking you then turns into a sexual fantasy. Mm. And I think Probably similarly, this is the sort of the root cause of a lot of women's rape fantasies. It's a rape belief, sort of like, well, this will happen. So I'm going to try and deal with it by incorporating it into a fantasy. And I found that a very interesting subject to look at and kind of go, oh, is that a better way of understanding it? In your conversation with Sam, he talked about how the algorithm, the social media algorithm, whether it's TikTok, YouTube, Insta, serves men and women very different things. And you then compared your phone with a male friend's phone. What did you learn? Yeah, that blew my mind. So again, as parents, this is so much of it's down to being a parent and not knowing what world your kids live in and realizing how, I think, purposely siloed off kids' lives are from ours. We are not able to make informed decisions about our children's world. It's very different to us. So I'm very aware of the bad things about social media. But for instance, on Instagram, which is a fluffier place, I'm like, oh, well, Instagram is a lovely place because all I'm getting is pictures of kitchen extensions and spaniels because I'm a 48 year old woman who's into kitchen extensions and spaniels. Then I looked at one of my very close friends and completely the same politically and socially. He also loves spaniels and kitchen extensions. But a third of his Instagram feed was women in sort of like unnecessarily tight yoga gear in slightly suggestive poses mm. like and a lot of them and given that I'm a woman who does yoga and he's not a woman and does not do yoga I was very surprised about this and then looking at Sam's mobile phone he's a teenage boy these are women who are doing yoga in bikinis and underwear with links to their only fan sites at the bottom of it and he was just going just simply by them knowing my age and my gender this is what I'm being pushed like I am constantly being mm. tempted seeing pornography they funnel are towards porn yeah and the porn thing like with Sam I mean his story is I mean he's such an incredible boy the story he told but like he was so consumed by pornography he also has OCD that he became completely sexually dysfunctional he was saying he along with a lot of his friends who were also addicted to porn when they were having sex with girls in real life they would have to put pillows over the women's faces because it was too overwhelming for them to be in a real life situation where they were looking at a woman's face. They oh, just wanted wow. to be watching porn instead. They were imagining porn instead. Which was like close-ups of holes while they yeah. wanked. Yeah. yeah, totally. But so you're literally having yeah. the thing that you want, the thing that porn's supposed to lead to, having sex with a woman. Again, they had not been wired to want to have sex with a woman. And the idea that humans with our brilliant brains and our technology have managed to screw up sex, particularly for younger people, when animals are just banging on shed roofs yeah. in the rain, nary a care in the world. Well, you've said we've inserted business into it, haven't we? It's business. Yeah. You are it's someone's business model. Like it's kind of like, you know, at the end of your dick is someone's business plan. And the amount of young girls I know who've watched pornography from a young age who are like, well, look, I never want to have sex. It looks horrible. It's violent. I'm going to end up having my head put down the toilet. I'm going to be strangled. And boys, similarly, are like, what? So I'd have to be really fit and hench and throw a woman around and hurt her? Yeah. Is that what I have to do? Yeah. I mean, it's just. Is that what women want? Yeah. It's be such a tender, vulnerable, silly, beautiful thing. Yeah. And instead, it's this money-making thing that has just scared a whole generation of kids into either not wanting to do it or having sex, which. A friend of mine, the first time I was alerted to this, she's a woman's campaigner and she was approached by a mum whose 15-year-old son had come home in tears. And he was like, I tried to lose my virginity with my girlfriend today and I started to strangle her. And she started crying. And he went, why are you crying? And she went, well, I don't want this. And he was like, well, I thought that's what girls wanted. And they were both <sighs> utterly traumatised. Yeah. And that's why we need to be very informed. There's no point in having like a serious conversation with your kids about this because they were just going to go, no, I don't watch porn. The way to start that conversation is go, are any of your friends watching porn? 
like, what's the weirdest thing one of your friends has seen in porn? Like, kind of like, what are the porn films that are going around school? Because kids will often not respond because they don't want to let you down. They don't want to shock you. They don't want you to be hurt or upset. But if you talk about their friends, that's when you start mm. to find out what's going on. On the subject of genitals, you point out that women know lots about each other's vaginas, which is so true. Like, even if you don't live in a house with other women and girls, you know a lot about your friend's vulva, don't you? I know the entire backstory. I know exactly how many stitches my girlfriends have had. I know yes. which men make them go sandy and dry. I know what those <laughs> vaginas want. I know how yeah. their HRT has affected it. One if of they've the- got pubes on them. Right. One of my friends is using a testosterone cream that's made her clitoris so much bigger. It's a topical cream that she's like, I've got a little willy now. And she's very pleased oh, about it. It's all very so interesting. Because we talk about this stuff in our WhatsApp groups. All the time. And also all culture. the time. Sometimes before breakfast. All the time. And we're in yeah. peace. Don't give a fuck as women. Like kind of like this generation of teenage girls, they're buying vagina based merchandise on Etsy. Like kind of like yeah. on the bus, I can just hear 14 year old girls talking about their fannies and it makes me so happy. And their vibrators. It's yeah. wild. Oh my God. Every time I've moved my daughters to a new house, I just find a new and gigantic dildo. The last one that I found, I thought that it, <laughs> they had it by the side of the bed because they worried about burglars. I genuinely thought it was a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> can double as one. I was like, multitasking. Enjoy yourself. So proud of you. So I talk to my girls about their vaginas and their vibrators and all this stuff all the time. And it's joyful and funny and we bond over it. And that's the culture. The idea of a dad talking to his teenage boy about his dick and going, are you proud of it? Should we buy some merchandise about it? Like kind of like, tell me what it likes and doesn't like. It's such a strong and amazing thing. It's unthinkable. Like I sound demented saying that. Yes. But it's equally unthinkable for women to be talking about their vaginas to their friends. Before feminism. Right. So we know it can change. And yeah. it has to because the only way generally boys are communicating about their penises at the moment is dick pics. And that's not doing anybody any good. No one ever got a dick pic and went, oh, do you want to talk? <laughs> when your book is made into a movie, the scene I'm most excited to see is the one you describe about spending a stoned afternoon talking to your husband's balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I enjoy. I enjoy talking about this live because we lose a couple of women in the room, but the rest of them are like, "Yeah, I get you." So I was, I was interested in because I've spent so much time talking about vaginas and vulvas, and I was like, I just want to make it as fun and acceptable, and just a game that you want to play in the pub to talk about your dick in the same way that women talk about their vaginas. And so I started to sort of look at the psychology of the male genitalia. So I think the penis and the balls have the same relationship with each other that Goose and Maverick have in Top Gun. So like the penis is tom cruise is the main character like the film's about the cock right the film's about tom cruise but he's not particularly lovable like kind of like it's balls you're right he's thrusting but he's not like cuddly yeah whereas balls are like the comedy sidekick they're okay they'd be played by like jonah hill (laughs) or james corden they're like oh i've fallen over like balls are a bit scared about the mission and balls are just more emotional so yeah one stoned afternoon, I lay in bed and I was just staring at my husband's testicles, having a chat and stuff. And then suddenly as an experiment, I just started shouting at them and going, look at you, you mad hairy ball bags. Look at you. What are you doing, you crazy <laughs> bastards? And they suddenly retracted into his body and started rippling with fear like a cuttlefish. It's super emotional. And I went on Twitter and asked guys to talk to me about their balls. And they were just so brilliant at describing them. One of them was saying on a hot day, they get plastered on either side of my thighs like a pink bat stuck to the side of a cave. Others were sort of describing them as kind of like weird gastropods kind of crawling down my thigh in the bath as the hot water gently relaxes them. It was oh wow, beautiful, juicy and surreal description of men's balls. And I was like, we need more of that. Like, I can't think of a comedian who's doing this stuff. Like, we've got Amy no. Schumer doing comedy routines about how her vagina smells like a barnyard. And the pop yeah. Lily Allen performing under balloons that say Lily Allen has a baggy pussy. I don't know any men who are talking about their cocks and the balls like this. And most importantly, talking about size. So I was one of those people on social media who, when the ex-porn actress Stormy Daniels a couple of years ago, described what it was like having sex with Donald Trump. And she described him as having a smaller than average penis that was shaped like the mushroom guy from Mario Kart. And that additionally, he had very dry pubes like shredded wheat. Initially, I was like, ha, 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 la, 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 la. It makes sense. The weird guy yeah. has weird genitals, la, 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 la. Mm. Then I started to deep it from a feminist perspective. One, 
it's a very outdated notion that we see someone's personality and morality in their body. Like that's something that women have really tried to sort of like detoxify those kind of conversations with women. We don't do that with women anymore. We don't judge women on their fannies. And secondly, if I was a 15 year old boy with a smaller than average penis that looked like any character for Mario Kart, I would just be going, oh my God, everyone's going to laugh at me. This makes me a bad person. I've got Donald Trump in my pants. I now feel shame and guilt. And I don't know a single man in the public eye who has ever confessed to having even an average, let alone smaller than average dick. And that seems crazy to me. Like one in four men have a penis that's between three or four inches on the flop. And yet no man has ever admitted this. And again, if a teenage boy who has a smaller or average penis would just be going, well, I must never talk about this. Mm. No man in the world has ever admitted this. So what will I, a 15 year old teenage boy do? I guess I'll just hate myself. And I hate that. I want for our teenage boys what we've given our teenage girls, which is no shame, no guilt and a sense of possibility and future and everything being comic material that you can share with your friends and just laugh about your life. There's so much in this book. We've only got a few more minutes. I just want to ask you a couple more questions. Why won't men go to the doctor, Catelyn? Why won't they go to the doctor? Why? Why won't they? Oh, So I was talking to a GP and he was saying that if a woman walks into his surgery and he says, why are you here? She'll list symptoms. Man mm. walks into the surgery and he'll go, my wife made me come. My girlfriend 100%. made me come. And obviously, and I've learned this on the live talk, there is a 10% of men for whom this isn't a problem who are massive hypochondriacs and who are just literally <laughs> Googling everything and coming into the room going, I've definitely got dengue fever. And the women are like, no, you don't. Well, that would lighten our mental load, being married to one of those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all mental. Everything is mental load, right? Yeah. So I started asking why this was, and there were eight answers, but the two main ones were, one, men are scared of being told off. They won't go for a general health checkup because they go, no, I'm not healthy right now. In two years when I've lost the weight and I've got a jogging routine, then I'll go to the doctor for my health checkup, which of course is completely the wrong reason to go for a health checkup. Correct. They're scared of being told off. They're scared of being shy, being overweight or eating bacon or drinking. They don't want to be shamed. Right? They're almost like little Mm. boys. They don't want to be told off. And then the second one is the word heartbreaking is really unexpectedly the word that I use most when I was writing this book. It's that men are quite noble. It's that women and children into the lifeboats first. They were like, I don't want to take up queues and waiting this places where a woman or a child or someone else might need it. Like kind of, I don't want to make a fuss. You know, oh, That's a beautiful you know, spin on it. I like that. Yeah. They genuinely yeah. were. Like, I heard that over and over again. Or I can't get time off work. I've got to earn the money. I'm self-employed. I can't do it. So this kind of stoic, kind of noble, not complainingness. And there's no hierarchy of pain or mental illness. You are a man in pain. Your pain is just as equal to a woman or a child or an elderly person. So you've got to see yourselves as human beings, guys, like not as men, And which is my main plea in this book. We need to start treating men like human beings in the way that we've really argued for women to be treated like human beings over these years. You and I are in our third act, I would yes. say. I became a grandmother a week ago. <gasps> You're fucking me. My eldest son just became a father, oh which is... God. So interesting in itself watching that. You say that men need a third act, that the cliche of the male third act being having a midlife crisis, buying a red sports car and running off with his secretary is such a cheesy idea. Why do men lead a third act and what would it look like? Well, I make an impassioned plea to understand the midlife crisis, really. I think women are really good for planning for their third acts. Like women retire and they're like, I'm going to go hill walking. I'm going to take up salsa. I'm going to learn pottery. I'm going to buy a camper van and drive around the country. Men retire and then suddenly it's like, who am I? So yes. this terrifying statistic that one in five men over the age of 50 say they have no close friends. And they don't plan for their third act. So what they tend to do is either repeat the first act again, they replay their teenage years, they get the earring, they get the motorbike, they get the tattoo. And unfortunately, culturally, we laugh at that. And I've done it myself, like, oh, he's a teenager. Whereas when women have a kind of midlife crisis and, like, go Shirley Valentine and start shagging you under bloat, we're like, yay, go for it, girl. And I make the plea to understand that, like in the words of Eric Morecambe, it's all the right life stages, but not necessarily in the right order. Because the majority of men that I know that had that teenage midlife crisis actually weren't teenagers when they were teenagers. They were either studying too hard, they were looking after their parents or siblings, they might have been starting a business, or a lot of them would just felt too fat and ugly and shy to go out and be a teenager. So as long as they're not hurting anyone to have your teenage years when you're an older man, we need to celebrate that in the way that we do with women. And secondly, the very common thing of men's first marriage is failing and then they start a second family. And you hear them say this over and over again when they have kids with that second family. 
this time I'm enjoying it. This time I'm there. This time I'm doing the night feeds. This time I'm present. This time I'm being a dad. And that broke my heart that we have not looked at socially how the lack of paternity care and the pressure on men to earn their money when they're young means they fail in their first marriages and have to, with all the heartache and social ruin that that causes, and it's only when it's later and they've earned their money and they feel more secure that they can finally be there as a father. And that's wrong because like in 97% of divorce cases, primary care is given to the woman because we usually were the ones doing everything. And obviously we're amazing, but I don't want us to be the ones that are doing everything. Clearly parenthood should be shared. Like kind of like clearly. And if there are economic and social reasons why men are having to let their first marriages fail with all the bitterness and sadness that that entails and start again, then we're doing something wrong and um, we need to be having a conversation about that. We need to start talking about fatherhood in the same way that we talk about motherhood and having those campaigns and those conversations. And just finally, my friend, you asked on Twitter what was good about men and a lot of people thought it was a feminist trap. They were very nervous because it's like, are you going to make fun of me? I felt really sad reading that because it's almost like they're so used to being attacked and blamed for everything. I mean, you know, world's tiniest violin, but individual men, as you say, are not the patriarchy. What were some of the responses? I wanted to end the book because I'd spent so long talking about men's problems and the sad things and the heartbreaking stuff. As I got to the last chapter, I was like, well, if I really am making a plea that we need to change things and we should start a men's movement in the same way we've had a women's movement, what usually starts a successful movement and it is positivity it's hope it's an offer of you're going to get something out of this and not only that you're going to be recognized and feel good about yourself so I wanted to make that last chapter what is good about men so I started to list all these things like the sort of the loyalty when men love you they love you forever their protectiveness like the energy the playfulness the non-judgmental nature of them and then I realized that I was essentially describing dogs (laughs) So I went on social media and went, men, you tell me what's, men and women, tell me what's good about men. And they started replying with all these things. And then they said, oh, I'm basically describing dogs. Men are like dogs. <laughs> Which is a great starting point to go from. Like kind of in the same way that we've really celebrated our women and we see what women bring to the world. I think we've just actually, because all we talk about is toxic masculinity, we don't talk about the good things. Just men's desire to muck in, make the best of life. They're complete non judgmentalness. They're straight to your face. The instant forming of a gang, the ability to bond over trivia. Good at banter. Yeah, so good at banter. Like, you know, women mm. are good at really emotional conversations, but sometimes you need to walk away from Jan mm-hmm. and Bob who've been talking about their uteruses for five hours and go to the other side of the room where there's a bunch of men who put a huge piece of cheese on a fork and are running around going, I'm the king of cheese. Like, we need... <laughs> that balance. And I just, I'm all about the balance. Anything that men want from women, they need to come and take it in the same way that we have come and taken from men. And that's my final offer to men is feminism has been really great for us. And I just think you'd like to bang on it. I'm passing the joint round. Come and come and suck down on the bifter of feminism. I think you would enjoy it. <laughs> my son and his best friend have a game that they play when they get together where they look at a building or they imagine a building or a stadium and they try to work out how many watermelons you could fit in it. I love these games, yeah. That's not something women would do. We would be like, for better and worse, like three minutes in, even if it's a stranger, we'd be talking about our birth stories and our HRT and what vibrator we use. Or or for extremely online feminists, how it might be problematic to put watermelons in a stadium and kind of like, you know, what the labour work cost would be to that and all that kind of thing. So, So true. Yeah, and men's sort of ability to just always be working out who would beat who in a fight. Like whole yes. evenings of men going, could a bear beat a swan in a fight? Would yeah. Thor be able to beat Inspector Gadget? <laughs> and kind of like, and I, I love that. It's beautiful. My husband says it's like bird song. It's this beautiful, inconsequential, without beginning or without end kind of flow of positive sound that men sort of spend. And I, I love a bit of banter. I'm always happy to get on the banter bus, banter bus to Banterbury and be banter claws. It's a very bantery book. I hope I've is- translated feminism into man banter and they will understand. It's hilarious. Thank you for writing it because it's given me some ways to talk to my son and make him feel seen, heard and understood in a way that I can so effortlessly do with my daughter and that you've helped me do with my daughter as well over her childhood and adolescence. So yet again, thank you for fixing the shit. 
all I want to do, I want to amuse, but I ultimately want to be useful. So if any of this was useful to you, I'm absolutely delighted. Thank you. So, so useful. Much. And the thing about being proud opened a really intro- important discussion between my son and I. Oh, my God. A oh. really important discussion, which he raised because uh, he and his friends have been saying exactly what you said about it's easier being a girl. From their point of view, it is. So your instinct as the mother of a girl and as a feminist is to go, no, it's not, rape. And then you can do the two. Two things can be true. It's difficult for both. I'm really hoping that off the back of this, that like other men will want to write books and boys will want to write books and just the the conversation is start. I think it needs to be the start of a conversation. Like kind of like we just need to come at boys at a slightly different angle with a slightly different understanding and give our teenage boys what we've given our teenage girls. We can see how they've thrived. Let's let those boys have a bit of it. If you want to buy Catelyn's book, What About Men? I've already bought copies for several friends. I highly recommend it. There is a link in our show notes. And if you loved her and want more of her, this is actually the third time I've interviewed Catelyn. There is a link to my original interview with her in 2018 in the show notes. If you want unlimited access to the subscriber-only episodes we make of No Filter, if you want to support the work we do at Mamma Mia, we make a huge amount of content for free, but we would love your support. It's like around the cost of a coffee per month. Please make sure you become a Mamma Mia subscriber by clicking the link in the show notes. This episode was produced by Cassie Merritt and Emmeline Gazillis. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Joanu. I'm Mia Friedman, and thanks for having us in your ears.